Good evening. Welcome to New York University Abu Dhabi. I'm Dave Shikitano. I'm the Dean of Science here at NYU Abu Dhabi and a professor of biology at NYU. For those of you who are new to these institute lectures, welcome and especially welcome to our new campus here on Sadiat Island. For those of you who've been with us before, welcome back. And I'd like to extend a specific warm greeting to our colleagues and friends who are visiting us from the Cleveland Clinic here in Abu Dhabi this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Charles Gross. Charlie's research is seminal, and he studies brain structures and visual perception and visual learning, with emphases in the inferior temporal lobe cortex, blind sight and development, the representation of space in the brain, adult neurogenesis, and even the history of his own discipline, neuroscience. Charlie earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard University and subsequent to that a PhD in psychology at the University of Cambridge. In 1970, he joined the faculty in the Department of Psychology at Princeton University where he is now Professor Emeritus. His list of awards is extraordinary. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences for one thing and has published well over 300 papers in his discipline, extraordinary by any means. Tonight, the title of his talk is Neuroscience of Memory. So welcome, Charlie, to Abu Dhabi and to the United Arab Emirates, and we're very pleased to have you with us. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is a very, very exciting development, the whole idea of a, uh, a first grade international university is really, is really something. I've really been <coughs> inspired by um, by everything I've seen. I must admit I didn't know too much about it before I came, <coughs> but it's really impressive. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a story about how a brain operation in 1953 led both to the tragic life of the patient and to the first knowledge of what parts of the brain are involved in different types of memory. The patient's name was Henry Mollison. But in the medical literature, he was known as H.M., or Henry, until he died in 2008. Well, before 1953, essentially nothing was known about what parts of the brain were involved in memory. Literally nothing. Uh, an early idea uh, was Plato's, who wrote really as a metaphor there is in our mind a block of wax, and that whenever we wish to remember anything we see or hear or think of, we hold this wax under the perception of thoughts and print them upon it. And whatever is imprinted, we remember and know as long as the image lasts. But whenever it is rubbed out or cannot be imprinted, we forget and do not know. Uh, <clears throat> I hate to say, uh, the details of how memory is stored haven't advanced too much <laughs> since Plato. But we do know, as we'll see since, thanks to HM, uh, a good deal about the different parts of the brain that evolved in memory. The first person to try to localize memories in the brain was Franz Joseph Gall. Uh, there's a picture of him uh, palpating the skull because he had the idea that um, he had the, uh, well, actually had the brilliant insight that the cerebral cortex was made up of a set of psychological organs, each for a specialized um, psychological function, like, like memory. Uh, but he made, the, he, made the, he made the error of thinking that he could assess the size of these organs by palpating the skulls of patients. Um, <clears throat> now, his greatest opponent was J.P. Florone, who, on the basis of his experiments on pigeons, argued that psychological functions are distributed throughout the cerebrum, throughout the cerebral cortex, and are not localized. Now, these two views, a discrete localization of memory in specific brain regions versus no specific localization at all, continued into the 20th century. In fact, the leading person, Carl Lashley, and the dominant view, in fact, the almost universal view, was similar to Florone, unlike Gaul, namely that memories are spread throughout the cortex, 
There's no special place in the cortex that's more important for memory. And rather, the greater the damage to the cortex, the greater the memory impairment. And this was known as the law of mass action. And it was generally accepted as, as the best information that we had. Well, this was soon changed by an event that was, as I mentioned, simultaneously a personal tragedy and the beginning of the modern science of memory involving H.M. or Henry. So H.M. began having epileptic uh, seizures at the age of 10, maybe related to an earlier bicycle accident. His epilepsy um, gradually grew worse and worse until it was life-threatening and certainly uh, made impossible any normal existence. So he was referred at the age of 27 to uh, the Hartford uh, neurosurgeon, William Beecher Scoville. Here's a picture of, of Henry at that age. So Scoville uh, was a psychosurgeon, actually, and he performed many frontal lobotomies on, on patients who had been diagnosed as psychotic. Uh, but he wasn't satisfied with the results. In fact, he was unsatisfied. He saw the frontal lobotomies as not be, being particularly helpful. So he, he, he thought he'd try something different. Rather than cutting out a chunk of the frontal lobe, he thought he'd cut out a chunk of the temporal lobes, specifically a large structure in the temporal lobe known as, uh, as hippocampus. And, it, and it, in order to as I'll show in a moment, in order to remove the hippocampus, he also had to remove a big uh, part of the, of the adjacent cortex. Uh, now, um, now, two of Scoville's patients, of his psychotic patients, um, happened to suffer, suffer from epilepsy. So he gave them these temporal lobotomies, these large temporal operations, in order to treat their psychosis. It had essentially no effect on the psychosis, but their epilepsy seemed to get better. So they said, aha, we should try this operation on HM. So he proceeded to, um, to remove from both hemispheres of HM's brain a large portion of the temporal lobes. I'll show you this um, in a couple of figures. Okay, so this is a side view of the human brain. Here's the front, the frontal lobes. The red is the temporal lobe. And if we look through the cortex underneath to the subcortical areas, we see this large structure, the hippocampus, and nearby another structure, the amygdala. Here's another view. Uh, if we take a cross section through the brain, through the temporal lobe, this shows the cross section. So the hippocampus is down here. Here's an enlargement. So here's the hippocampus, and here are these two adjacent regions, uh, parahippocampal and um, perirhinal cortex. So the surgeon, Scoville, in order to reach the hippocampus, had to dig through and remove this, this tissue. So he ended up removing this chunk of cortex and the hippocampus on both sides. Um, so after the surgery, HM's uh, seizures, ac seizures actually got a little bit better, but to the horror of his family and the surgeon, his ability to remember any new experiences was completely gone. He couldn't remember anything that happened to him since his surgery. He couldn't recognize anybody new. He couldn't recall a conversation that he had a few minutes ago. If you asked him to count, he could actually count, but if you interrupted him, he had no idea what he had been doing. So he left the hospital with this devastating memory loss and could no longer form new memories. This amnesia lasted for the rest of his life. He died in 2008 at the age of 82, his life having been devoted, in a sense, to the study of memory. Here's uh, what he looked like at 65. Um, he looks rather happy, and we'll, we'll discuss that actually later on. <laughs> so at this time uh, in Canada, uh, the great um, Canadian neurosurgeon, Wilder Penfield, had been successfully treating epilepsy by making uh, 
temporal lobe operations on one side, unilateral operations, unlike Henry's, which had been bilateral or on both sides. And two of Penfield's patients seem to have developed or developed a memory problems after the surgery. And um, then it turned out on further examination that these two patients, their supposedly normal temporal lobe was actually abnormal. So the effect of Penfield's surgery of removing the hippocampus and a chunk of the temporal lobe um, on one side will actually was produced bilateral damage because their good side was actually not a good side. So they were really uh, bilateral cases. So when um, Penfield's graduate student, a, a young woman called Brenda Milner, uh, presented these cases at a neurological meeting in 1953, Scoville was present and he noticed that these patients seemed a little bit uh, like his. So he called up Penfield, and Penfield sent his graduate student, Brendan Milner, uh, uh, to carefully study HM, and thus began the modern neuroscience of memory. Uh, there's Brendan Milner in 1957 as a graduate student. So HM turned out to be an ideal subject um, for the study of memory. Uh, Milner found him to be highly intelligent, he had quite a high IQ. He was willing to sit for hours of testing. His perceptual and cognitive abilities other than memory were absolutely normal. He was able to focus his attention on the task before him as well or better than any normal subject. He was very good-natured, eager to cooperate. He never got bored. Of course he never got bored. He never remembered anything. <laughs> or restless because, of course, everything was continually new to him. So. In his initial studies with Henry, published in 1957, Milner discovered a number of basic facts that were totally new at the time. He discovered that a specific part of the, of the brain, namely the hippocampus and or the adjacent cortex, you couldn't tell then, is necessary for the storage of facts and experience. Without this part of the brain, no experiences, no knowledge are stored. Secondly, um, Henry was able to remember events of his childhood. And it could, his memory was quite normal up to a year or two before the surgery. So thus, long-term memory is not permanently stored in the hippocampus or adjacent areas. That was the second major finding, that the hippocampus is, is necessary for the storage of information, but it's not the place where stuff is stored. Thirdly, Henry's immediate memory was perfectly normal. He could count. You go one, two, three, four, three. Remember the previous number as long as you didn't interrupt him. You could have a, a normal conversation with him, except if you stopped and paused for 15 for 20 seconds, he had no idea what, what had been going on. Uh, so thus, immediate memory was a different process from long-term memory and didn't require the hippocampus. And fourth, it was clear that this very severe this amnesia can exist in the presence of otherwise normal perceptual motor and language functions. Milner then made another extraordinary discovery, which eventually led or to the realization that there are different memory systems in the brain for different types of memory. This began when she tested HM on this motor skill task called mirror drawing. So in this task, Henry can't see his hand, he can't see the pencil. Um, all he sees in the mirror is his hand, the pencil, and this double star. And his task is by looking in the mirror to trace between the borders of the star. Now, of course, when he moved his hand left in the mirror, it looked like he was moving it right. So it takes a while to learn how to do this. So normal people take a certain number of trials to learn this task um, before they can do it. it. It turns out that Henry could learn this task absolutely as well as normal people, 
he improved on the first day. The second day he did much better. On the third day he did perfect, but he had no memory at all of having done this task, although he clearly learned it. So at first, uh, Milner thought, well, this looks like motor skill learning. This looked like a motor skill. was an exception to HM's amnesia. Milner then discovered that there was something else that Henry could do called the golden incomplete figures task. So in this task, the subject is given the, the most incomplete one to these first. It's given this one first, and then separately this one, and then this one, and finally this one. And a person is asked to say as soon as they can recognize what, what it is, OK? Namely, eventually, by the time you reach the fourth one, it's clear it's a fish. But then a couple of hours or days later, or weeks later, or months later, if you show this to somebody, they will recognize the fish from the early figures. Here's another situation with the table. Again, uh, it takes a couple of trials, but then people will immediately recognize it's a table. Henry did perfectly well on this, although when given the test a second time, he said he had never seen it before. So his perceptual learning was normal. So, um, so she had shown that he could do these two types, a motor skill memory test and a perceptual memory test. In spite of his total ability, his total inability to remember he'd ever done these tests and his inability to remember any new facts or events. So like any great discovery, Milner's finding raised a host of new questions, some of which have been answered in the 50 years uh, since this work began, and some of which are still central questions in memory. Here's a picture of, of Brenda Milner now. OK, she's 96. She's still very, very active. She's as smart as ever. Uh, she's <laughs> she can still. Um, actually downed four scotches in a row and still be the smartest person in the room. She's still extremely active and is clearly the leading uh, person in the world studying um, human memory. OK, so let's list some of the, the questions raised by her work. The first question, obviously, well, is there something special about Henry? Are there other amnestics like Henry? Because nobody had ever. Um, had a case like this and knew it was related to uh, hippocampal damage? Well, the answer is yes. It turns out uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, viral encephalitis, and severe anoxia will all produce Henry's syndrome. Because all these conditions will produce severe damage in the hippocampus, often damage to only the hippocampus and not the adjacent tissue. So the, the patients vary from being worse than Henry, or not quite as bad as Henry, but essentially there's now a, a set of people who could be studied. Then secondly, the question is, well, Milner had shown that, uh, that Henry can do this perceptual learning. He can do um, uh, the mirror task. Is there anything else he can do? It turns out what was impaired in him is what was called declarative memory. It's impaired in him and other temporal lobe amnestics. It requires hippocampus and or the adjacent cortex. This involves memory for facts, known as semantic memory, memory for experience, known as episodic memory. It's usually conscious, and it's usually uh, involves knowing and planning. But then there's a whole other types of memories known as non-declarative memories. These are intact in HM. They don't involve the hippocampus. They're usually unconscious, and they're usually involved in, in doing something. So there are um, four main types of non-declarative memory, which are absolutely normal in Henry and other amnestics, and don't involve the hippocampus. And as we'll see, each of them involves a different part of the brain. So one type of non-declarative memory is known as Repetition priming. Now, in repetition priming, what happens is this. You show the subject a list of words. 
You don't ask them to memorize anything. But in order to get them to look at the list, you ask them something like, uh, which words have an A in it? So you give them this list, episode, faculty, radius, and so on. And then a few minutes later, you give the subject a triplet of letters, some of which are the first three letters of these words, and some are other triplets of letters. And you simply ask the person, what's the first word that pops into your head when you see this? So the person who's just seen this list, when you show him CLA, he'll say clay. When you show him CAL, he'll say calcium, and so on. So this is repetition priming. Obviously, something got stored, something is being remembered, and HM and other amnestics are at least as good as this as normals. And the goal in incomplete figure test is really a type of repetition priming involving um, a graphics rather than letters. So this is one type of non-declarative memory. Another type is classical conditioning. Uh, this is similar to what uh, is familiar to you as the conditioning of Pavlov's dog. So specifically what Pavlov did, um, he paired a bell and injecting some meat into the dog's mouth, and the meat alone would uh, result in salvation. But after he paired uh, the meat and the bell a number of times, the bell alone would produce salvation. That's called classical conditioning. And in humans, uh, the, uh, this will be done with use of an air puff. So if, uh, if you present an air puff to the eye, the person will blink. But if you pair it with a bell, after a couple of times, the bell alone will produce an, an eye blink. This is classical conditioning. This is, in a sense, remembering that the air puff, sorry, remembering that the bell predicts that an air puff will come. So this sort of memory is intact in HM and other amnestics. Emotional memory is a related type of non-declarative memory. Uh, if pain occurs in a particular situation, um, returning to that situation produces fear. This is emotional memory. Actually, this was shown in the 19th century, um, with, uh, observed by a famous French neurologist, um, uh, but he didn't know quite what to make of it. Uh, this, when this amnesty came into his office, he shook his hand, but he had a pin in his hand. So when he shook his hand, uh, the patient got stuck with the pin. Well, the next day, when the patient came in, this patient was an uh, amnesia. But when the, when the neurologist held out his hand, the patient wouldn't shake it. So he obviously had remembered something from it. So this is another type of non-declarative memory. Finally, uh, another type is... Um, uh, it's habits and skills. So, for example, um, the ability to do uh, a motor task like the mirror tracing, it's a habit or a skill. The ability to um, do a jigsaw puzzle. So once uh, an amnestic has done the jigsaw puzzle a few times, he's as fast at doing it again as the normal. Um, so that would be a perceptual habit or skill. And then finally, uh, the ability to uh, read in a mirror or read upside down is an example of a, a verbal skill or memory. So these types of non-declarative memories are completely intact in, um, uh, in Henry other amnestics. Now let me try to go back to the second question. And that is, remember, the surgeon, in order to remove the hippocampus, had destroyed the surrounding cortex. So the question is, what's the relative contribution of the damage to the hippocampus and the damage to the adjacent cortex? Well, for a number of lines of evidence, it looks as if um, the two types of damage have different types of effects. So the evidence suggests that memory for experiences or episodic memory, requires the hippocampus, whereas memory for facts, or semantic memory, requires the surrounding cortex, the, that area I showed as, as parahippocampal and perirhinal cortex. 
One interesting line of evidence um, for this uh, came from the study of uh, some children um, who had been um, subject, uh, these are actually three teenage girls who had been subjected to um, severe anoxia at birth. And so it turned out by from imaging studies that their hippocampus had been severely damaged by this anoxia, but the, but the surrounding tissue was perfectly normal. So these kids uh, were in high school, were perfectly normal, had normal academic records. So their um, semantic memory was normal. They learned normally. But they couldn't remember what they'd eaten for lunch that day. They couldn't remember what clothing they had um, uh, worn the previous day. And they couldn't remember the new people they had met. So thus, their episodic memory uh, was, uh, their memory for experience was gone, suggesting that these two types of memory uh, require these two um, different parts of the brain. Of course, Henry and many other amnestics had both. Okay, so let's see. So, um, so we talked about the different kinds of declarative memory. And it turns out that each of these requires a different part of the brain. So without going into the details, repetition priming requires sensory cortex. And if it's done, uh, so it requires the cortex in the rear, uh, in the posterior part of the brain. Classical conditioning requires the cerebellum. If you damage the cerebellum, or if patients have a damaged cerebellum, uh, they don't have normal classical conditioning. And finally, skills and habits require a large uh, nucleus in the frontal lobes known as the striatum. So thus, um, we see that there are uh, separate memory systems in different parts of the brain required for different types of memory. Now, some additional questions raised uh, by H.M., and indeed, this is a, a much older question, that why is it that after brain damage, recent memories are lost and older memories are maintained? And in fact, in the recovery from other types of amnesia, uh, due to other types of damage, um, the same situation, this has been known since the 19th century, the older memories are, uh, are maintained and the newer memories are lost, but in recovery, the old, the, gradually the older memories come back until finally only the most recent ones are lost. So, so this phenomena of the, uh, the older memories being more resistant to damage is known uh, this phenomenon is known as retrograde amnesia. The idea is, is, is just really re-describing it. The older memories, the older a memory is, the stronger it seems to get, the more resistant to damage. And so it is said that, quote, the older memories become consolidated. So this is, um, so the uh, the explanation, it's not really the explanation, but the, the description of this phenomenon is often known as consolidation theory. And uh, in its modern form, as a result of experiments on animals and on humans, um, it goes like this. Sensory information comes in through each sensory system through a series of, uh, uh, through um, a hierarchical um, series of areas until finally it reaches uh, the cortex around the hippocampus and then it reaches the hippocampus but the role of the hippocampus is then transient and after the consolidation is complete uh, the memories get transferred 
to cortex where they are permanently stored. So it's a cortical damage that will produce permanent long-term memories um, stored. Now, um, we don't know very much about the nature of this consolidation. Um, we know somehow when information comes in, it goes to the hippocampus, it gets organized or consolidated into declarative memories. This takes some time. If the hippocampus is injured before the consolidation period is finished, then the new declarative memories will be lost. But if enough time passes, then the memories somewhat, somehow get transferred to cortex where they are, are permanently stored. And the, the length of this consolidation time varies with, um, with the species, with the type of information. In rats and monkeys, consolidation of uh, certain types of memory seems to take days or weeks. In other words, if you train an animal on a task, um, and, uh, and you wait several weeks and then destroy its, its hippocampus, his memory will be normal. But if you destroy certain parts of his cortex, he will lose the memory. It looks like the memories get transferred from hippocampus to cortex. Um, but we don't really know the nature of this process. And there's a great deal of uh, work today, particularly using imaging and molecular biology techniques to try to figure out what the nature of this consolidation is. Um, one possibility is that it has something to do with this now um, speculation. Uh, the possibility um, that it has, um, has something to do with what called, what's called adult neurogenesis. It was discovered uh, by about the 1990s that new neurons are formed in the brains of adults. So up until that point, everybody had agreed that you get no more neurons after, uh, uh, just after birth, and you're just stuck with the neurons that you have. But then it was discovered that in a couple of parts of the brain, particularly the hippocampus and the olfactory bulbs, new neurons are born and continue to be born throughout life. Uh, you've probably read a bit about this uh, indirectly. You probably read that exercise is good for you. Okay. Now, yes, exercise is certainly good for you, but it turns out one of the many reasons why exercise is good for you is that exercise enhances hippocampal neurogenesis. So you put rats in a running wheel, and they get more new neurons in the hippocampus, and they're better at learning tasks. And the same thing, people aren't put in running wheels, but there's also there's similar evidence from humans that um, running and other types of exercise will enhance cognitive function in humans, and this is believed to be due to enhanced hippocampal neurogenesis. Now. Um, so uh, uh, you see a lot of advertisements about uh, memory games to help your memory and to buy this game and that game or do crossword puzzles and so on, so on, so on. You, the evidence is very clear that you're much better off going out and running. Now, whether these games are not do any good is unclear, but what is very clear is that exercise is very good for your hippocampus and it's very good for your memory. Okay, and I'm not selling um, running bicycles or anything. Um, although I have friends actually who are actually who are collaborating with uh, these bicycle companies <laughs> and studying um, before and after a lot of bicycle running. Okay, well, getting on to this speculation about consolidation. Um, so I just said the consolidation time. Uh, in rats and monkeys for certain tasks in days or weeks. And this is in the range of time that these new neurons last. One of the characteristics of, a, of adult neurogenesis is that the new neurons get formed, get hooked up, apparently are important for learning and memory, and then die. 
So one speculation is that they, particular neurons die after memories are transferred from the hippocampus to the cortex. That's just a speculation. Uh, now, one interesting uh, variation among the different amnestic patients is whether their damage uh, included parts of the amygdala. Now remember, the amygdala is right next to the hippocampus, and the amygdala was damaged in Scoville's operation. And the amygdala uh, is thought to be involved in various emotions like fear, aggression, pain, and pleasure. And this may be the reason that HM, unlike other amnestics who don't have amygdala damage, HM was rather insensitive to pain, insensitive to hunger. He didn't remember when he had eaten. He was never thirsty, and he had no interest in sex. So perhaps the amygdala damage was also related to his very placid personality. Perhaps the sweet, tractable man had been pacified by his operation. So Sue Corkin of MIT, who was a long-term student uh, of HM, she was actually Brenda Milner's Brenda Milner's student at McGill, and she continued to uh, study HM for the rest of his life. Uh, she was at MIT, and HM would come um, uh, and be tested by her at MIT. And actually, I met HM there and I gave him a couple of memory tests also. So, uh, Corkin suggested, uh, um, uh, wondered about the possible similarity between. Buddhist meditation, and Henry's state of being. Because um, after all, Buddhism teaches us that much of our suffering comes from our own thinking, particularly when we dwell in the past and in the future. Meditation is a method for training the mind to have a new relationship with time, knowing only the present. Dedicated meditators spend years practicing being attentive to the present, something Henry could not help but do. So when we consider how much of the anxiety and pain of daily life stems from attending to our long-term memories and worrying about and planning for the future, we can appreciate why Henry lived so much of his life with relatively little stress. Um, now, a final puzzle about the hippocampus is what's the relation between the role of the hippocampus in declarative memory and its role, subsequently discovered, its role in spatial memory. The first discovery that the hippocampus was important for spatial memory was um, a discovery of John O'Keefe, then at London. He found that single cells in the hippocampus of rats would fire would, would get active every time the rat was in a particular location. So here's um, uh, some figures uh, f from him. A rat is just put in this, <coughs> in this cross, and so one particular cell fired whenever the rat was in this location, as shown by the contour lines. But another cell fired when the rat was over here, and another cell fired when the rat was over here. So as the rat would say, progress through a, a maze, uh, his, these cells, known as place cells, would fire in sequence. Uh, and in fact, there's some evidence when a rat spends a lot of time learning this maze, and then in sleep, he's apparently dreaming about the maze because these same place cells fire in the same sequence that they fire when he ran through a maze. Um, Now, more recently, um, the Moses in Norway found another type of cells related to space called grid cells. So this is a diagram showing uh, just a path of one rat running around. But every time he came to these red places, the cell would fire. That is to say, the cell would fire uh, in, in a grid. So as, as if this grid was stored 
in the animal's brain. And just a few weeks ago, O'Keefe, shown here on the left, and the Moses, Mary Britt Moses, and Edward Moses from Norway, shared the Nobel Prize for what the Nobel Prize Committee called the discovery of the brain's GPS system. So the best known evidence um, <clears throat> for a role of the hippocampus <clears throat> in spatial memory in humans comes from London taxi drivers. Um, <clears throat> as you probably know, in order to become a London taxi driver, you have to memorize this incredible uh, um, labyrinth of routes in, in London. I may have a picture. This is a teeny little picture of London showing a small number of the streets, and many of them are, are one way and often to get from one place to another. You got to cross over one bridge, you cross back another bridge, and so on. Um, and um, it turns out that London taxi drivers have much larger hippocampuses than normal people, and if you study them as they learn their way around the streets of London, the hippocampus gets bigger and bigger with the spatial experience of driving around London. So how this, um, how this function of the hippocampus and spatial memory relates to its role in declarative memory remains to be seen, although people, just like people speak of these as place cells, there are people who speculate that there are like time cells in the hippocampus. So uh, we'll see in the coming years how these two hippocampal functions can be related to one another. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to um, try and answer any questions that you have. What about issues of language? After HM uh, had his operation and he, he started being tested for various things, did people test whether he could remember new words? Did he acquire a different vocabulary? What happened to him linguistically? No, his, I believe his vocabulary never, never increased. In fact, um, one of the ways that Sue Cork had studied in detail the nature of his retrograde amnesia, rather than just asking what he remembered, was to test him with popular songs, with TV programs, with national events, with national figures. And by doing that, she could more closely measure just when his retrograde uh, amnesia started. And so um, the idea was that uh, new terms that uh, he would have been exposed to a year or two before his surgery were lost, whereas terms that he had learned as uh, earlier were not lost. Thank you for your lecture. And also, um, so for example, you said that HM was stuck in his 28-year-old brain. Yeah. So did he himself know that he was unable of remembering anything new? And was he like aware that he was stuck in his 28-year-old that, brain? That's a very interesting. It's a very good question. He often says things like, I'm sorry, I don't have the quote. He says, every day for me is like the same. So he had and other amnestics often have some notion that there's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with their memory. They have some, uh, they have some uh, vague idea, yes. There's another famous, um, uh, on YouTube, there's a, uh, an English composer, English musician, who, due to, I think, viral encephalitis, had the same condition. And uh, uh, on YouTube, you see how anguished he is. He knows that something is wrong because he sometimes writes, writes down. He writes the same thing over and over and over again. But from this, he, he realizes that something is very wrong. Hello. Um, Lately, I've been reading quite a bit about you know, people claiming to have repressed memories. Do 
any of your studies over the years support anything like that where you know they they seem to have had pretty normal lives and and suddenly when they are older they have suddenly have memories usually after being guided by some form of therapist work yeah that's a diff that's a, that's a, that you imply that's a very difficult scientific problem that's a very difficult social and ethical psychiatric problem uh, the overall situation, particularly when you're talking about um, memories of being sexually abused, um, uh, some of these old uh, repressed memories turn out to be real, and some of them, uh, the evidence suggests, turns out to be induced by the therapist. You're quite correct. Uh, but in any given case, it's hard to know. I mean, the bottom line is, there's a very large amount of, so, of sexual abuse of children by adults. And there's um, excellent evidence how uh, a therapist or a psychiatrist can induce and alter memories of events that never occurred. So both things are true. So in a given case, it's often difficult to establish which of those two. Question I have, HM had lost his hippocampus, so no recovery was possible, but yes. for people who have damaged hippocampus or hippocampi, is it possible to uh, regrow or, or, or regenerate or, or no. repair the damage? No, not in the, not, in, uh, people with known major hippocampal damage, uh, there's no evidence of of regrowth at all. Now there's a whole other whole field here that since we do know that new neurons are born every day in our hippocampus, the question is uh, can the, can these new neurons be harnessed to help in brain damage, so we don't know, but this is an interesting current question. Also, we don't know why, in, uh, the evidence is good that there are new neurons in the hippocampus, there are new neurons in the olfactory bulb, and if there are new neurons in cortex, there are very, very few of them. We don't know why, okay? We don't know why these two areas of the brain, you get adult neurogenesis, and in other parts of the brain, you appear to get very, very little. We don't know why. But if we did know why, if we could find out why, if, if we could find out what's molecularly different about the, um, the neurons in parts of the brain that can um, be produced and the neurons in other parts of the brain that can't, if we knew this difference, then now we're moving into science fiction, but much of medicine and science was once like science fiction. So if we knew what the differences in these two parts of the brain were, maybe someday we could unlock the reasons that cortical neurons don't seem to be produced very much. So this adult neurogenesis is of great interest as a potential way of um, dealing with brain injury in the future. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, can you identify the role of sleep in consolidating memory from the hippocampus? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Um, uh, I'll answer it in very, since not much time. Uh, um, sleep plays a very, very, very important role in memory. A very important role. Um, uh, it's not, the evidence isn't clear which parts of the brain are playing this role. The evidence isn't even too clear whether it's REM sleep, that is a dream sleep, or non-dream sleep that is more important. These are controversial, but it's no question that sleep is a very, very, very important part, plays a very, very important role in consolidation and in the whole memory process. And, and this is an area of very active research in humans uh, and animals. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite all of you to a reception and one more round for Professor Gross. Thank you. Thank you.